Right. Everyone ready? All right. Is this on? Oh, it is. Great. Welcome to uh, the first panel of the day, the best panel, the most important panel, the only panel you really need to attend. Um, we're going to talk about some very interesting things um, as soon as I figure out what it is. My name is Bruce Eisen, um, entertainment attorney here in town. I have the privilege to moderate this panel. And we've got a uh, esteemed panel to talk about uh, over-the-top video, video to devices, all kinds of different video. Uh, I'd like to start by asking each member to go down, take a minute or so, tell us your name, uh, company you're with, and something relevant. Uh, my name is Albie Gluten. Does this need to be closer? I guess you can hear. My name is Albie Gluten. I work for Sony Interactive Entertainment. We're the guys at Sony who sell video games, music, TV shows, movies, uh, and PlayStations. Um, before that, uh, I was at Universal Music Group, where I oversaw their technology. Uh, and before that, I was uh, a record producer, sold about 100 million records. So I, you know, I'm an expert in nothing, but pretty good at pontificating on most things. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Scott O'Neill. Uh, I work for a, uh, a technology company um, that provides essentially a uh, monetization platform to uh, companies who want to sell video content either transactionally or subscription based. Um, I'm originally from the UK but live in New York now and I've been uh, involved in this business for uh, about 10, 10, 12 years um, and helped a lot of companies um, drive a lot of revenue from uh, subscription VOD. Good morning. Uh, my name's Anthony Laser. I do content partnerships and programming uh, for Zumo. Zumo is a natively integrated uh, platform to access digital content on smart TVs. Uh, currently in the U.S., eight different OEMs uh, utilize Zumo as a direct access point for uh, digital content. Hi, I'm Jason Friedlander. I uh, run Director of uh, Marketing Communications for Verizon Digital Media Services. We are the infrastructure back end for a lot of streaming services and uh, media delivery around the world. We are the second largest CDN in the world and power over a couple hundred million hours of video streamed last year alone. <coughs> Mike Alexander, I'm with IBM. I'm the CTO and Chief Architect for the telco and media and entertainment industries. Um, and deal with our over-the-top offering called Video Cloud, which we use to deliver uh, content uh, either through Ustream or clearly video content. I also am responsible for the use of blockchain, um, and we've started doing work around blockchain for royalty settlements as well as for advertisement settlements as part of the media and entertainment activity. I'm Richard Whitman. I'm the CEO of Audience Delivered. We find customers for people. I guess I've been in the OTT business under different names since 1979. Um, we specialize in behavioral uh, marketing and primarily using Facebook and uh, Instagram. It's very interesting. I want to talk to you after this. Um, my name is Bruce Tuckman. I'm uh, I was most recently president of AMC and Sundance Channel Global. I spent years before that as president of uh, the Worldwide Channel Division for MGM. Um, as of the last year or so, I've started kind of my own business where I'm investing and advising in emerging digital companies. For instance, I sit on the board and invest in uh, a data, a, a substitute, let's say, for Nielsen using data to really accurately measure TV audiences. The company's called Parrot Analytics. I'm an advisor to uh, Ketcha Group, which was a, a, one of the largest venture capital groups out, out of the Asia Pacific region. And um, I also am advisor to iFlix, which is the leading um, OTT streaming video platform, subscription streaming video platform in the emerging markets. Um, and I spend a lot of time just working on new ideas for a vertical or niche OTT services. Thank you. So I, I'd like to start with uh, Jason and Michael, actually. Uh, there's been a ton of new over-the-top video entrants in the past year, and SVOD, and more coming. W when is the internet going to break? Right? I mean, how can it handle it all? It, it can handle it today. 
I, I think a lot of people feel that, uh, um, you know, there is this point where it can't handle it because all these things happen to break around the Super Bowl. Or, but if you actually look at the services that are falling down when those things are, it's it's rare, it's not the content delivery networks, it's not the encoding platforms, it's not the storage. It's usually like some weird thing like authentication, right? Like they can't get everyone who signs in can't authenticate quickly. So the traffic over the internet totally can be handled today. It's just that, you know, some of the microservices around what it takes to actually log into an application, um, maybe server-side ad insertion, some of those things need to be tweaked. But, you know, what's being watched on TV today is 7 million people. I think any streaming service can easily handle, you know, an average, the Super Bowl, if you're looking at 30 million people, you might have, you know, might be a bit of a struggle, but I believe it can handle. Mike? Yeah, and <clears throat> I mean, you've got LTE coming out at this moment, right? And we're going to start to see, you know, bandwidth is not going to be the limitations. Right? It will be other components that make up the, the total service. E even for live, yeah. right? even, even for, for live, live video. Yeah. It's, yeah. There's no difference, right? If, right? Whether it's live or VOD, it's a chunk of video being delivered down to an end user. Um, that, that's that's about it, and most CDNs have smart technology to yep. make sure the the best qualities are delivered out to the end user faster. And easier. yeah, it'll be aspects that will move the content to those edges versus you having a backhaul, right? Uh, that's where most of the, the the suppliers are concerned is how much backhaul capacities they actually have to deal with, right? In play of those types of things. Got it. But you can you know create multicast. You can do things like that that restrict that aspect of the flow of the data down. So, it, 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 I mean, there is some concerns as you start to go to 4K <laughs> TVs, mm -hmm. right? And you start to go to, um, you know, VR and those types of things into it, what they do to the capacities. But then it's not the, the transmission, it's what you do on the edge to cache those, right? And how much do you have to have for caching? Good. Anthony, have you guys run into any issues? Well, I have. I joined the company in March. So you got no problems. So in the last, yeah. in the <laughs> life last is month, great. Been fine. Yeah. The checks are clearing. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean we, uh, you know, we don't. We haven't run into any issues regarding that. I, I mean, obviously, live is a different animal. Do you guys do live? Yeah, we do. It's uh, you know HLS delivery. Um, but that's not, that's actually our content partners hosting it. That's not us actually hosting and streaming. Correct. Abby, do you guys, do you get involved so in any of this? We, um, for the stuff we do live is PlayStation View. Um, our partners in that are uh, ML BAM. And the, we've had no problem scaling. So they did the World Cup uh, the last couple of years. And the World Cup is nice because you have millions of people logging on at the same moment. Wow. And so they just go like, okay, here we are within the first two or three minutes, you will have well north of a million people. And they've managed yeah. to do it pretty seamlessly. So I think that, I, I think that, you know, when you talk about VR and things that take more bandwidth, those things are growing more slowly than the network size is growing. Yeah. Rich, I'd like to talk about something that's important uh, even more so than this, which is making money. Um, <laughs> you guys deliver audiences, right? Correct. And so, therefore, there's money there? It's you. Well, um, yeah, it's all about return on investment. Um, we have done between newsprint companies, uh, TV shows, um, uh, not a movie yet per se, but um, uh, trailers for movies. Um, we've been able to deliver actual interested viewers who actually view the majority of the whatever the video is um, for generally under four cents a viewer and the reason and the way we're able to do that um, we have a uh, we're one of 30 companies worldwide that have the highest level of access to all Facebook data and um, what we um, wait wait uh, what You've got some special deal with Facebook? Not so you special. It's just there's, there's, there's levels of API partner, and we've been doing this for six years with Facebook. So it's a matter of um, having been there, knowing what's going on, you know, keeping up with their code and mm -hmm. our code. Uh, you have to have certain requirements 
I mean, in order to be able to, you just, just can't walk in and say, I want the access. You have to earn the access. But what we then get is we get access to everything that Facebook is generating in terms of data. We've written our algorithms over action as opposed to demographic. So we find audience of like interests, and then we can break it down into demographic. And literally what we're doing is we're eliminating the perception of, you know, it's a female demographic from 18 to 25 to it's a bunch of people who are interested and then what we do is we go find um, uh, those people and we create and we optimize advertising so it addresses each audience with the right message. Um, and then we actively are bidding real time. All this is simultaneous. And really what it does is if there are 20 million people who you think are the audience, the reality is there may be two and a half million people who'd actually take an action. So we focus on the two and a half million to get the people who actually will take the action and use the gooder circle. And, and are you doing that strictly on Facebook, or are you doing it across different sites, or on your site? Where we, is we, this we, actually? It's on Facebook, Facebook and Instagram. And we've chosen Facebook and Instagram because the wealth of data makes the ROI so much better than any place else. I mean, and again, our the DNA of our company in terms of uh, knowledge is we ran, our team ran the largest, uh, most successful and profitable online um, uh, direct selling uh, business for um, Fox Interactive Media and, Inter and Intermix. Um, so we just, you know, it's all about our clients have money to spend and it has to be the right price. To, you know, it doesn't do you any good to spend $100 to find a customer if you can only make $6 on the customer. Right. So I, I want to ask one question that might be of interest. Facebook has all this data. Many people here probably use Facebook. Tell us, what data of ours <laughs> are you actually getting from Facebook? Um, we actually see everything, but we don't know who you are. Okay, but what, when you say everything. Everything what, you what, do what, on give Facebook. Give us some examples. Well, if you post, okay. if you write, if you're watching a video, I mean, anything and everything, every action you do on Facebook is tracked, okay? So what, but we don't know what's you. Do you cross reference it to other sources so you don't know that it's Bruce, you know it's XYZ, we know but it's, we know XYZ is a if, entertainment lawyer in LA. No, we just know if you have an interest in tennis, you have an interest in tennis. Okay. I mean, we also have, we also have databases that cross reference purchasing history, but again, we don't know it's you in particular. We just know that to us, you're just a piece of data that says I'm interested in tennis, I like yogurt, I have, uh, you know, three mortgages. You have uh, been following me. And, <laughs> so, and then what we do is we serve you with the content that you, we know if you like tennis, we'll serve you with if it's, you know, something oriented to tennis. We're not going to serve you pole vaulting if you have no interest in pole vaulting. It's not like search and Google where you put in, you know, you look for one thing and then for the next six months you see the same ad showing up. Yep. Yeah. So do your, do your IDs persist? So you know that right now, you don't know who Bruce is, but you know he's a guy who likes tennis. Do you know tomorrow when you come in, this guy who liked tennis yes. yesterday is the same guy, it turns out he also as, likes bowling? As long as the, ca yes, and we, as long as the campaign is active, yes, when the campaign closes, then all that, again, it's an artificial intelligence learning engine, so, but once the campaign's over and it stops, then you start from scratch again. But if it's an active campaign, <coughs> Um, we'll know, but we won't go, if, if we've gone to Bruce two or three, two to three times and he hasn't taken an action, then we don't go to him again. So when you say you, when the campaign ends, yes. you flush the data, that's because of your agreement with Facebook? Or? No, we just stop the campaign, the campaign's over. If we go back in again, we have to start a whole new campaign. Why? Because that's their rules. Oh, so those are Facebook's rules. Correct. And, they, and there are, so you're agreeing with them, stops, makes it, you would be in breach of your agreement if you kept that data, which no, you could. No, it just, it, it, there's nothing, it's, we don't have control. I mean, we run a campaign, when it's done, it's done. If we All have right, to so go, they give you access to data. You don't keep any of the data. If we pause a campaign, okay, we stop mm -hmm. a campaign in the middle of it, and we have to restart for any reason, all of that aggregated data is lost. You start from right. scratch again. So you cannot, collect that data and put, the, put it on your own server? Absolutely not. 
we do have we have no access to that. Got it, Scott. You provide uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. Basic infrastructure to uh, OTT players, correct? Like billing and CRM. Well, we would hope it was quite complicated infrastructure, really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we do a little bit of what um, what he's just talking about there regarding machine learning and tracking anonymous users, um, not using Facebook though on, on on the native website or within the native app using digital fingerprinting technology. So we identify people um, upfront who are coming and again attribute their likes, wants, needs, interests um, on a site or across a range of sites, um, and then use that data to actively promote. Um, products or, or, or different types of content. So you are tracking me across different sites. Yeah, well, only different sites that may be within uh, in in, our, in a group of sites for a client. You know, they're not across. Can't be across every site because the, the the probe needs to be inst installed on that particular site in order for us to track you. Uh, and then we use that data to you know, promote different products and, and aid conversion is essentially using uh, sort of automated decisioning. So, you know, you, you put users into different buckets and segment them up in different ways. And then you have rule sets that says if this group of users fall in this bucket, you promote these types of products and uh, offers to these users. And it, it very much aids conversion. Excellent. Bruce, I want to talk a bit about uh, the proliferation of SVOD. Um, and, and particularly in terms of, you know, Showtime has it, CBS has it, HBO has it, and I know you didn't work for those companies, but you worked for another one. Do you have any thoughts in terms, it seems to me that virtually, if not literally, every network either is or is working on or will be launching their own direct-to-consumer. And, and, and these are pay networks. I mean, even CBS, even the so-called free ones, really aren't because everybody gets TV, almost everyone, through a pay TV service and that pay t TV service pays CBS to be able to carry it. So long-winded, but my question is, if they're all going direct to the consumer, what does that mean for the pay TV universe, for the direct TVs or the Comcasts? Are they out of business soon? Um, well, I notice with some of them, their, their salaries <laughs> seem to be increasing. <laughs> At exactly. larger leaps, despite the loss of subscribers, so I, I do honestly think there is a certain generation leading these companies that just are kicking the can down the road on the problem. They'll get out, they'll leave it to us, or they'll leave it to my kids. Um, but that business cannot be sustained at the level it's been. A lot of people will be pushed out. It will become smaller, meaning the linear pay TV experience, especially if it's just delivered by a satellite and you don't have any way of communicating back and forth. That, that can't last. People really are demonstrating in, all over the world that they prefer to watch content on demand, a little more personalized. So that's all accelerating. I, I believe that in the not too distant future, literally every channel we're used to knowing will be an app. And But what I mean by an app isn't that you're going to go to an app store and download it, but the cable operators who are using this expensive, proprietary, clunky technology to deliver a channel to you, it's just going to all be streamed eventually. Everything will be streamed. There'll be a lot of different models. You may be bundled into the cable operator's platform with a mixture of linear and on-demand product and charge consumers that, or you may go B2C. Um, but that is the future. And what's exciting but also challenging for many people, the business model of just being part of a big basic tier and having tens of millions of subscribers and taking out a lot of money and more money each year as subscribers grow, as your fees to the cable operator grows, that's over. So the people like Showtime and CBS All Access, some of these folks are doing great. Netflix obviously is 50, 60 million subscribers in the US. There are other apps that are doing very well in that regard, but not all of them will prosper. The ones that are winning either have an overwhelmingly um, compelling selection of content, have started first, or they're involved in a niche and they're crushing that niche. I would say like WWE has two million subscribers over the top. Those are the guys who are going to prosper and the rest will either perish or they'll just have one of thousands and thousands of apps out there looking to make some money from a consumer or be bundled in an Amazon third-party channels business. I think that that's the whole future. And it's very different 
um, but the consumer will, will be, be the beneficiary of that. Well, will, will we, as the consumer, be the beneficiary, or will we be the loser? Because, you know, one thing that could happen from what you said is smaller networks will be gone. Um, and some people presumably like that smaller network that's no longer going to be here. So for those viewers, I mean, they're the loser, right? It's how do, the, how do the networks create content if they don't have money coming in? Then they, they should go out of business because they're bad networks. It's the content. If you know how to promote and generate money off your content, you should not put form over substance. So, yes, there will be some linear channels, old school linear channels. You can name a dozen of them. They're already marginal in your cable system. They'll go away. They won't commission programming. But that's not to say there's a net loss of programming in the world. The money shifts to a more valuable forum in which to serve up that programming. So, or there's, homogenized might be another, there's another word that comes to mind. Uh, yeah, but there, I think there's less chance for that because when you go to the streaming platforms, the amount of data people are getting doesn't lend itself towards homogenization. Free broadcast does because no one really knows uh, who, who the audience is, so they wind up delivering more or less the same thing, the same formats. But I don't think that happens in an OTT world where Netflix can realize I have a pocket of people interested in this area. I don't want them to churn off. I'm going to serve something up for them. And when they're producing 80 shows a year, and you can see it already now, they're all very different. And arguably, they're a lot better than anything going on in basic cable right now. I, th I think there's a nicheification that is going on. So you can uh, create programming much less expensively. Some people can create it with one camera and their friend. And you have access. And if something is attractive to you and you can make something inexpensively, then you will have an audience. So wait, 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 no, wait, wait, no, no, no. no, no, no. Yeah, so the, the two, if you no, can no, make no, something I'm, inexpensively, then you will have an audience. No, no, no. Explain no, I how said, exactly how I said that works. If you have an audience, <laughs> oh, they okay. will find you. <laughs> the same way if I if I owned the Golf Channel, yep. I would say, okay, I'm not. This is expensive for me to produce. Um, I don't have a lot of viewers, but my viewers are pretty well to do. Uh, there are probably other opportunities that I could use to target my target audience who are golf aficionados, and I could generate revenue in other ways. People will be creating content in many, many different ways, and it's not necessarily going to be just the big high gloss. I mean, Netflix is lovely, but they spend a lot of money and do high gloss, and they are still looking at the mass market. How about with uh, Zumo? So Zumo's, you, uh, Zumo's an AVOD platform, so okay. let's just cl clarify that because I think there's a really uh, a major difference. One of which is that, you know, we're, when you're talking about some of these low-cost niche audiences, there needs to be a low threshold for discovery, especially when you're a new brand. And so that's where the AVOD platforms serve an important purpose. You know, with if you take YouTube, obviously that's where people start to build a brand. Um, you know, through uh, basically free but a advertising monetized content. With what Zumo does is an AVOD OTT platform. And so what we find, we have a, roughly 100 channels now. We'll probably top out at about 150 because it's basically stitched into like an MVPD-like guide uh, line of linear channels that are within these def different uh, smart TV environments. And so what we do is we start to, one of the things that, that I do is kind of scout out some niche channels that aren't available uh, in, from, in a linear OTT environment. They may be available on Roku and some of these other, but Roku, we're talking about 3,000 different apps. So if you're not in the big five, you know, your Netflix, your Amazon, you have to do a lot of spend on, on Roku to actually aid discovery of your channels. Right. Zumo's different in that we are all AVOD monetized, and so uh, the discovery happens within a basically like a, you're sitting there with your Flickr clicking through the different linear channels that we've stitched together. And so um, so that kind of is a, is a difference from an, uh, from an AVOD to a SVOD. And most of the con 
content on Zumo tends to be more short form, or is it more, you know, 30 to 60? It, we're actually calling, I mean, it's actually some of the more popular uh, content is, is mid form. So we're talking eight to 10 minutes. Also, we've had some success with some of our live stream partners like CBSN. CBSN has this 24-hour live feed of news. And so when someone comes into the Zumo environment and realizes, oh, I can watch basically a live news channel all day in a free environment, uh, there's server-side ad insertion that's happening on that, um, then they then it becomes a, a, a easy consumption, news consumption avenue where they're, they no longer, either no longer need their MVPD or they just choose, uh, uh, or they don't even have one anyway and it becomes part of their, um, their grouping of a la carte programming that they watch on a daily basis. So no, for the end user, the I'm sitting card. at home and I've got my uh, Amazon Fire or my Roku box, so I go and, and I'm on there. Mm -hmm. First, I have to search through it all and find a Zumo app. Is that correct? No. <laughs> this is the thing that is a little bit different than Zumo than, than an app. Is, For instance, if you have an LG TV yep. and you plug it into the Internet, Okay. There is an immediately you're in a channel plus environment, which it basically generates a MVPD like channel guide for you. All 100 Zumo channels are instantly in that. So channel plus is not an app you have to download on your LG I TV. See. You immediately have access to digital content powered by Zumo in that LG environment. And then uh, Abby has the Abby channel on Zumo. Mm -hmm. How does anybody? Find that, or you know, have, know what it is, or you know, yeah. decide to watch well, it. Well, we have a, a splash page, a hero unit, basically like your Netflix, like your Hulu, where you enter the environment, and there's basically two thirds of your screen is a, a promotional unit. Mm -hmm. Now that can either be um, it can be purchased by our content partners to aid discovery of their channel, or if they have. Um, some sort of uh, t timely content that we, and we have the available ad units, we just provide them with that free promotional unit. So for instance, Newsy is a big partner. They just did a documentary about what's the current state of the Ukraine. Uh, we had some available uh, promotional units and they, we created some graphic assets and ran that around the launch of that documentary. Cool. Can, can we talk for a minute about um, AI and re-aggregators? Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> I, I knew there was... I was that was the next on my, my list <laughs> so, right here. It says, so, you know. It's a good transition. <laughs> yeah. So you look at companies like Amazon and Roku, and they're very interested in suggesting to you what you would like to buy so or would like to watch. And so the more... One can only assume Amazon, with all that they're doing, that when I'm on my Amazon Fire TV, it is going to know what I've watched, and it's going to suggest pretty robustly within a, within a few years, particularly with the Echo, knowing what I'm doing and where I am and what my proclivities are during the day. It's going to say, you would probably like this, and you would probably like that. And by the way, these are the channels that you should subscribe to. And they're, as the channels begin to disaggregate, then the Rokus and the Amazons are re-aggregating them for you so that you would have your personalized selection. So. Maybe you don't care about ESPN, maybe you care only about sports. And so the people in the end box who are, they're just, uh, I don't know, widgets attached to their service and their AI infrastructure are gonna be getting better and better at recommending to you what you would wanna use. And when they start to get it right, which Netflix has never quite done yet, um, partially because of VIPA, which we don't want well, to I don't about. think anybody has done it. I, Can you think I, of anybody who's done it well? Uh, no, and I think... Yeah, I, 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 I would say in music, Spotify, others have done it well. I, but I think TV, no, it's... And, and do yeah, we think Amazon's VIPA using an engine is to blame? That, well, well, I'm so, I, I just thought Amazon's using an engine that is familiar with your shopping habits. What I've always found deficient is there's no personal contextual mm. thing. I may not... Maybe we're all the same or not, but what I'll watch at night... It's really different than when I watch during the day or on a weekend or something. This is like a family that. audience. I just want you to. Yeah. <laughs> Even alone no, or with a family, it's across it's, all it's, platforms. We, you see different different uh, watching patterns in the yeah. morning as opposed to the evening. Right, and a lot of Amazon, a lot they they just don't get at that yet. It's a whole very different thing than I have to 
buy a new pair of shoes, so I pretty much want to buy this similar to the last pair of shoes. So there's a lot of work to be done on that. But I think the music services are getting it a lot better. And do you think that's because music is just inherently easier than video? Or Spotify is just incredibly smarter than everybody else? I think it's a combination of both. I think that TV, video on demand services, need to incorporate more of the personalization that Spotify has. It's a, it's a, it just strikes me as a more nimble, newer um, platform and technology. So Are you I think, familiar with the Video Privacy Protection Act? Well, there won't be that anymore with our current administration. <laughs> well, so I, I, we can do whatever we want. Uh, do you remember uh, Judge Bork? And uh, the, for those of you who don't remember, he was uh, some uh, uh, journalist, found his video rental history and made it public. And Congress was outraged, and they uh, passed an act called uh, VIPA, the Video Privacy Protection Act, which made it very, very difficult for people to keep track of what people are watching and want to watch on video to the extent that you may also remember that Netflix, um, I think it was a $2 million prize for someone to come up with the best recommendation mm -hmm. engine. And then when they had it, they were sued and had to not use it because of VIPA. So I think you find that Amazon have great AI, and they will be guessing better and better what you want to buy. But we're constrained in the video space from guessing what you want to watch in some ridiculous way. Amazon and Netflix, uh, I mean, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Google can know everywhere we go. They can track our phone. They can see what we buy, listen to what we say in our house, um, watch us on our screens, and yet we can't keep track of what people have rented in order to make better recommendations for them. Well, in the OTT space, too, the other <laughs> challenge is that you have data of who purchased the television, and you have the IP of who set up the router in the house, mm -hmm. but you don't. Uh, that doesn't mean that's who's watching. Right, but that's changing. So there are, right. there are a couple jump, of... Don't be shy. Okay. This is a so, tough crowd here. <laughs> all right. I've run networks. I've run broadcast companies. Um, and I ran, and I was the head of programming and marketing for a major cable company. So I can tell you that everything you guys are talking about is all yesterday, old school. Okay, the reality, how we set up our business and what we see, is I don't care what you watched yesterday. That has no relationship to what you're going to do today, tomorrow, the day afterwards. Um, smaller uh, content companies, I don't care whether they're news, whether they're entertainment, whether they're special interest. We know globally on Facebook, we can look for an interest and find 50,000 people, 150,000, 2 million people, 3 million people, okay? So we start with a base of people who have an interest, okay? People use Facebook, it's a communication tool. So if you think that earned media I don't care who you are, if you're a network, anybody else, if you think earned media in the competitive space in the next 20 years is going to get you seen, you'll get an audience, but it won't be the audience that When you, you say can. earned media, meaning what exactly? Meaning that word of mouth media. Okay. okay. You have to buy your audience. You have to look for and pay for people and bring them to you. Facebook allows us to bring people to them, find people of similar interests, and present them in an ad. Hey. Would you be interested in this? Now, like I said, if you're interested in tennis and I show you pole vault, that's a waste of money. But if I show you that here's all this tennis video or tennis channels that are available, you may not even be aware, okay? And because it's not linear, it's video on demand, you can click and stay on Facebook and watch that video on Facebook. You never leave, okay? Everybody's talking about Facebook to go someplace. Facebook has more videos today. It's like the place for video. It's going to be the place. It's going to be, it's the biggest network, continuous network in the entire world. So why would you ever want to leave it? Okay. It's the traditional media companies are saying, I've got this app. I've got this. It's like, it's going to be one of a lot of places. Why should I go on Roku if I'm a content provider, pay a 30% tariff when I can go on Facebook? and spend half of that money on marketing and present. So you, you think HBO and everybody else should 
drop everything else and just no, be on Facebook? It, there's or, no or, one or answer. Focus on be on fa- focus no on one Facebook. Answer. I mean, there are people who like sat. I like my satellite service. I'm not going to watch I everything on a computer. Okay, so I'll always have satellite. People like cable. Always have cable. But I also can call up my. I've got on my phone. I mean, all I have on here are video services. Okay, and I watch it either there on my pad if I'm sitting out in my backyard. Okay, so eventually, I think all the smart guys are going to get it. And they're going to go, hmm, I better have something available as VOD also on Facebook and not just linear. Hmm. I mean, linear has a place for advertising. You know, it's, it's there, but it's not the only answer. So mm-hmm. when you talk about smaller or specialty content plays, they can't just look at generate enough investment to make the product. They should be thinking about, I make the product, I have to market the product. Okay. And once you have an audience, and, and we can tell them all kinds of information that's useful for advertisers and audience, they could also have the capability of, of charging it on a, on a per, you know, subscription basis on a per view or on a monthly service. It's basically, this world is now freeing up all the content people, whether they're the biggest networks or, the, or an independent, to have their and deliver content and control their own destiny if they're prepared to be entrepreneurs and go forward. It isn't a sub, it isn't a replacement of, it's an addition to. Got it. Michael, uh, IBM has a, a product called Watson, uh-huh. uh, an art, artificial intelligence uh, product. You got, right? Mm-hmm. You guys doing anything in the area of recommendations and getting people to watch more and spend more and all that? So, yeah, I mean, the ex- first case was training Watson on video okay. right? and letting it learn, which was the Morgan movie where we did the pre-roll ads and, and everything, developed it through Watson. So they were pre-built based off of the aspects of the, com- you know, the targeted community right? and different genres of, of the types of pre-roll ads that might entice the customers to come, right? So that was the first example case of where it started to, to play into video content. Now it's about, once we've trained it to the video, it's about how do I ingest existing content? Because what's missing is part of this is the meta information that gets me down to understanding within the video play, you know, specific, um, uh, attributes that I'm looking for relevant to the communities that then I target that ab- that particular video to. So it's going now into this aspect of ingesting the content, right? And bringing that long tail content into a knowledge that says I can generate those kinds of recommendations. And then driving that through advertisement aspects of I've got a particular advertiser who's got a particular type of product that they're looking to partner or combine with the particular video to make a better hit on, you know, scoring on that particular advertisement play. So it, it's there. It's, right now it's about how we um, move it from uh, moving the content to where we ingest it to how we move the, con- the ingesting capabilities to the content. Cool. So we don't have to migrate content for being able to drive that learning. Got it. Jason, do you, does Verizon do anything in this area for its clients? Yeah, sure. So our entire service for years has always been every time a user hits play, so any of our customers, when, when they hit play, it's always a one-to-one session re, uh, relationship with that user. So it's allowed us to use our services APIs to know about the content, create what we call virtual linear channels for uh, customers on the fly or um, essentially not playlists but you know short short form linear so like it could be a, up to like 10 or 15 assets stitched together with ads and then obviously call out to the ad decision systems to serve the right ads but we found that when you do these kind of longer in, um, linear like experiences that users are more engaged to watch they're more open to um, advertising if it's not offensive to them and it's targeted to them and they'll watch for much longer periods as opposed to if there's 
a stop of a video, a load of a new video, and like the traditional playlisting. So we've, we've, we've done that for years, having that one-to-one -one connection and stitching these experiences together for the end user. And then obviously we want to get much further down the road, partnering with people like IBM for Watson to learn more about content. So, so content owners can you know, learn more about what they have in their library to be able to offer n more unique experiences. So we've just seen with a customer of ours, Synodyme, they just launched the mm. Dove channel using our tools of virtual oh, linear okay. channels, right? So, and that is, hey, we've got this subset of content here that we can do something with. And like Alby said before, it's nicheification. You know, it's really just, it costs nothing to what traditionally costs millions of dollars to set up broadcast infrastructure and playout systems and all that stuff. You can now do with simple API calls and get and get your content now on platforms all around the world. So Newsy, <coughs> Newsy's a big one of we power Newsy. So you know they're able to do these things that they traditionally could not do because of cost. And now you can reach much wider audiences or, that are actually smaller in size because it costs much much less to get your content to whoever you needed to get it. To. Cool. Thank you. You know you, you said something I want to pick up on, which was advertising uh, as long as it's not offensive. Right. Which uh, sparked in my head what we saw earlier this year with YouTube, putting up patently offensive yeah. ads in front of content and content uh, brands, you know, bolting. Yeah, I, yeah, I didn't mean like, uh, like yeah. No, I know, you did, I, I, I know you didn't mean that, um, but my question is to anybody who might want to answer it, you know, is that really an issue? Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, Especially I think in, in the rest of the world where we've got religious constraints, we've got other types of constraints. We can't, I mean, you get fined if you play that content, big time. But, but I think from an end user perspective, it's really about, and, and this is where the, the advertising industry has to catch up because they're kind of stuck in this traditional world of I got to go sell my ad spots. Well, the, the, the world moving forward is there's now millions, if not billions of ad spots because every single one is unique to per, per each yeah. user watching. There's no way you can fundamentally go out and sell that. You have to rely on programmatic backfill to make the right decision. And if advertisers and, um, and marketers don't start putting high quality ads in those programmatic pools to be delivered to end users, then what they're going to get served up are crappy, quote unquote, off offensive ads. Just like, I don't need to see this, but it just happens to be the only video ad. I want to see the Lexus ad, the, the BMW ad, the whatever, but there's, there's a huge gap between what exists in those pools today versus what, you know, traditional media buyers and, and sellers are trying to go fill those, those spots in, in those quote unquote linear feeds or bought assets or whatever. But I, I would say that the ads per se are offensive in this environment. Whether they're offensive, no one wants to see ads. And I think there's going to be a growing gap as as there's more opportunities for advertisers through digital programmatic buying to smartly target folks. Um, I think there's a bigger divide opening up for quality content. No one wants to watch an ad, no one has to. Netflix, Hulu, HBO, these are the ones who are setting the bar now for quality, long-form TV content. And um, more and more, you have a bunch of players, as opposed to just HBO at one point, who doesn't have commercial interruptions. So there's going to be a lot of that. So I think a lot of advertising is going to get pushed off the higher quality content. And it will go into the more disparate smaller audiences, but it's it's going to be a real challenge. And then you add ad blocking software on top of that. Um, it's a real cat and mouse game in the advertising business is will be and is unrecognizable to what can, it was 10 years ago. Can we pivot this on another axis? So it seems like you have, with the HBOs of the world, you have this sort of immersive long form TV. Long form could be multiple seasons, but even at least it's 22 minutes, I'm um, considering long form. And then you have this sort of ephemeral short form that most of us adults think, oh, I'll watch a cat video on my phone, but I want to watch Game of Thrones on my big screen TV. And those of us who hang out with young people sometimes realize that they're just as happy to watch Game of Thrones on their, their phone. And my question is, is there a bifurcation between long form immersive, even if you're watching it on your phone, and shorter form kind of ephemeral and does that lead to a different business model? Is long-form immersive something that you're liable to pay for and more liable to watch on a large screen? And so you have the, the HBOs and the Showtimes having a different approach to business than those people who are primarily Facebook partners. Because the conversations about Facebook seems like it's a great way to get um, 
acquisition, to acquire a customer, but not a great way to necessarily keep a customer or engage them if you're a video creator. Why? If you're selling palm olive soap. Well, why? Why? I mean, it, if, you're, if you're watching the video and the, and the network is Facebook, the user does it. I mean, they're there. They haven't left. So they're watching a TV show. They can use Chromecast and put it on a TV set. They don't care. Uh, they can, but you are, what is your revenue to create that? You, so you're talking about posting it as an ad. No. You're talking about no, engaging people. No, you're using people. an ad to find people who have an interest, but I'm a, I'm a content provider, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't want to pay the tariff that Roku and Amazon and Apple charge, okay? Okay. I'd rather take the business risk and spend 15% of my revenue on marketing and distribution than giving someone 30% and having to worry if I'm at the bottom of a list or the top of a list. So can you talk about your revenue on Facebook? If they're watching it on Facebook... You what? own it. You, 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 you um, own what? Are you, the video, you're, you, post your, you put your video in in an iframe. You own everything. You're serving it up. So and, you're, you, you're, and you put an ad in there you're and you keep 100% of the ad revenue? In, if you want to put an ad, you can, you can serve ads. You I mean, if you're not putting an ad in, what's your revenue you, model? You can do a subscription model. But you don't own the end user data at that point. So a big content creator, um, they don't want to go there yet. Well, wait a second. Yeah. When you're on, you'll know who's watched. I mean, Facebook has all the insights. You'll know who's watched by Facebook insights. It's just... Will you have their email address, for instance? If they're, if you will, if it's an allow. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. uh, can, can you do it whereby it says, okay, if you want to watch this, enter your email address? If you do an allow like Zynga did, Right, and mm -hmm. anybody can go on Facebook, and you can and you can to have access to the content. You can ask for as much or as little Facebook information as possible. Okay, the more information you ask, the fewer people are going to sign up. Right? right, but if you want their email address and the content's compelling, people are going to give you their email address. Okay? And then you and know you, how much of each piece of content was watched, and well, you'll know that. in general. You won't know that you watched X, but you'll oh. know that. But I'll know that you watched. Okay, but so see, on HBO app, <clears throat> they know that I watched Game of Thrones. And then they can, market, they can market to me, you know, to buy Game of Thrones clothes or whatever. To buy a throne from my bedroom. Buy a throne from my bedroom, exactly. Yeah. Who wouldn't want uh, that? But I, can, but, I, but I know that you watch the show, okay? But I, you don't know which one. I mean, isn't, yeah, isn't that... Yeah, you're allow. Yeah, I do know. Oh, you do know. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. so, but still you're talking about... Enhancing the marketing. I just want to understand the revenue model. If well, I'm yeah, putting yeah. Game of Thrones on Facebook, uh, well, well, how well, am I generating revenue? Okay, first of all, if you're, if you're HBO, that's an accretive distribution network, okay? Mm -hmm. it, it, we're not talking about established full network shows like Game of Thrones. That's it's just, that's... Okay, so that's we're like, talking about CNN? But no, I'm talking about... Um, you're talking right. about a marketing you, platform you, where if I wrote Game of Thrones and I produced it myself, I could put the first one on Facebook and attract audiences and then sell it to HBO. Or I can just keep it and keep all the revenue for myself. I mean, if I want to spend, take the risk and spend a half a billion dollars of capital to go do a show <laughs> and market it, like it's no different than a movie. If I'm a studio, I'm going to go out and I'm going to spend two, you know, on a tent pole, a half a billion dollars all in for for the content and for the marketing and distribution, and then I got to hope and keep my fingers crossed. Well, you can do the same thing on HBO and not have to give 50% of the box office so I, to the theaters. I, I'm not trying to be provocative. I'm looking at so be provocative. What, what, the, what, what, <laughs> what the Facebook model is. So, for example, YouTube Red, theoretically, I can put something up there. I can charge for it. But, it is... But not, YouTube takes... Okay, well, no, but even ignoring that, I'm saying it has not been successful. If I had a huge show on YouTube, I could go back and I could negotiate a different revenue split. Once you have leverage, you have leverage. My question is, is that where you're going with Facebook, that ultimately... Uh, Facebook right now does not char. If you want to serve content on Facebook and you bill for that content, Facebook isn't going to charge you for that. What Facebook wants is for you to spend your money on advertising in the news feed, marketing, and promoting that show. Okay. Plus, they get all the data, or, and then so they're building up their database of information about you. And you can literally—I mean, to use—you could launch a Game of Thrones worldwide 
You don't have to go and negotiate any local rights with any local distributor because, you know, basically Facebook is everywhere. You know every day 800 million people to 900 million people are on watching on a, on a phone or a mobile device. Um, and a billion. Okay, so, but, but so you'll have to spend money though to get them to know about that. Yes. Yeah. Well, well no. no. So, it, it's, so let's, it's too, let's say it's too challenging right now. It's it's premature, I think, for the real expensive content to be able to do that. There's right. two. There's yeah. two things though that They're are not going on. Take the risk. Right. Well, what I heard, I don't know if this is true rumor, is the last three episodes of Game of Thrones. The last three are budgeted at $150 million. Mm -hmm. you, you can't recover that yet in any other form other than this network that they're all holding on to for dear life because that's so, the so only way they're going to get the money back. But the other thing I was going to say, I think companies like HBO, big companies, their biggest fear is Facebook owning just one platform in the world. So this is going to be a long, drawn-out battle between some real powerful companies, one who wants to have the platform the whole world and others who just desperately don't want that because they just lose control of their destiny. I, I guess I'm still trying to understand how the Facebook model works. <laughs> Let's say that I'm a little channel, I have a local channel, and I have a few shows that are good and they're advertising supported, and I run in Duluth and I make enough money on my advertising, and I put that on Facebook, and I get someone to link and they watch the video within Facebook and I have put my ads within the programming, assuming that... Right. So you get paid by the advertiser. You, the content... Yes, I'm getting paid. paid by the advertiser. That's so that's now, your business model. So that's the business model. So now it's just a link. I go into Facebook and there's a link and I click on it and you're in Facebook for all of one second and you're now watching my no, show. No, you're still in Facebook. Well, right. So I'm still in Facebook, but nonetheless... Your show in, is iframed within Facebook. Uh-huh, and I'm watching and that 22-minute show. Ads, so you'll get one of these two gentlemen here. They'll be giving you your backbone to serve up your content and your ads. Correct. My okay. question is, how is Facebook? Uh, I don't think that Facebook is going to stand for me using it strictly as a link, and they are displaying full They're screen. They're doing that now because, because it's more important. Their business model is to have everybody online on Facebook 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. okay? What you think is worthless, right, or giving something away, all that data and watching and paying for the ads, that they're going out and selling it to advertising and, and charging higher premiums for the ad space. That's their business. They're not trying to be in the distribution business per se. They under, if you listen and read anything that Zuckerberg says and Sandberg say, it's all about connectivity. They don't want to be a content company. Total, totally understand. Okay, and so to answer your question is, yeah, if you're prepared to take the business risk and serve and do all those costs and serve it up in Facebook, okay, and spend the money. With my ads embedded. Yeah, and then I get where you're going from. But they want, they know that in order for you to be successful, you're going to have to spend money advertising on Facebook to promote and market. Okay, so they get the advertising dollars to promote and market, and they get and they own all that data. They know who you know. They know who you are. They know what you're watching. They all this mm -hmm. stuff, which they get to then repurpose, okay, and sell to the big advertisers at a higher premium. We've got time for a few minutes. We have time for a few minutes. We have time for a few minutes. Yes, yes, it's a new thing. Yeah, we have time for a few minutes. So if anybody has any minutes. Just raise your hand and, and you can give them away. Sir. I got a minute. Um, that smells like monopoly. That smells like they're basically paying to take over Facebook. So what they're doing is they're just saying, give to us free. There's, I mean, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Everybody knows that you all know it. At some point, it's going to come back and they're going to be in charge of such a lot. I mean, a billion people already is already enormous. But when you're at two billion, there's nothing. Yeah, else they're at one point eight billion today. Yeah, at, at, at some point there's nothing. Or one point nine today. actually. So they can, they'll be able to change the rules at that point, and it won't be, oh, just give us your stuff, we'll do it for free. It's going to be something. Then they'll be sued by the government, and then if they're a monopoly, they get broken up. I don't worry. I, unfortunately, not this well, they'll own the government, and yeah. they'll own us. And how many else. people? <laughs> how many people in here have read John Taplin's new book? You should, you should you should all go read it because it is unfortunately our current state of competition law in the United States and enforcement is 
If it raises the price for the consumers, it's a monopoly, and if it doesn't, it isn't. And in fact, we have a few monopolies that are very strong that we are not fighting at all. They are uh, Google, Facebook, and Amazon, who are having a tremendous amount of power and control and are eating everybody else's lunch. If you look at the advertising business, it has been overwhelmed by Google and Facebook, and most everybody else used to have a strong business is struggling. Sir. And will student debt be the impediment for the millennials entering the cable market? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're worried about monopolies, I can tell you as an ex-cable guy, okay, we were monopolists, okay? Yes. And, the, and so I wouldn't worry about Google, and I wouldn't worry about Facebook. I wouldn't worry about it. I worry more about the people you have to deal with who are what we used to call, and I also built some phone companies, and it's the last mile company, okay? That's the guy who's the monopolist. That's the one who's charging you all the money, okay? So Facebook, you don't pay anything, but what if your cable company decides, and that's where you're getting your internet feed, decides tomorrow to charge you $100 a month, and that's it. It's either 100 or nothing. You have no say. Yeah, charter raises my rates, nothing I can do. Right, that's right. That's your By the way, net neutrality is being decimated. Yeah. Well, current. that's another whole panel. Uh, <laughs> but there is generally at least, <coughs> or at least two accesses for broadband into the home pretty much everywhere in the United States. I only have one decent one, but. Yes, you said that the, the Avon model is dying. So um, I think the million dollar question is how do you turn programmatic into profit? Because of course you can sell the data, but then where do the advertisers they go into smaller markets eventually, but that's not going to sustain the Escort market. You're going to need advertisers to pay for it because the number of subscribers is still not going to be what that is in, say, a Netflix. So where do you think advertisers are going to go? Yeah. Well, no, I think the subscription model has always been for actually hundreds of years will always be a viable model, um, and subscription services that are not Netflix, that are more niche-oriented, if they're done well, they'll succeed without advertising because their content costs will be lower. They don't have to buy um, House of Cards. They don't have to pay Kevin Spacey, whatever he gets, $5 million an episode or something like that. I don't know what it is. Um, and I think, I, I guess we all know it, if advertisers, if people want to market, they're going to figure out a way to market one way or another, you know, whether it's programmatic or whether something completely new is developed in the next 10 years that blows that away. Who knows? But I think the models still kind of exist standing side by side in some mixture in between the two um, in perpetuity. One more? All right. I thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.